Well, hello there. I hope you are having a great evening and you have everything all settled and you're all settled in and you've been able to make the most of the holiday, especially Yule and Solstice and that you are having a safe time spending it in whatever way you can to make it meaningful and full of love. I had said earlier that I really, really wanted to read this book and that I wanted to read it tonight. I wanted to be on here a lot earlier to be able to read this, but um, ADHD and the holidays, it's a lot of sensory overload. And it's a lot of overload for a lot of people. So I thought this would be the most meaningful way to be able to just kind of decompress a little, read a really great story. It's it's a beautiful. This is the illustrations alone are just phenomenal. So um, I think I have four cats on the bed right now because I'm trying to be really quiet because my kid is in the other room and they are in the process of recording some music and I didn't want to be disruptive, which is what took so long. And then trying to find the right spot where chaos wouldn't be ensuing. So without further ado, I present to you the Christmas Witch. This is the legend of the Christmas Witch with illustrations by Julia Iredale. And it's by Dan Murphy and Aubrey Plaza. This is actually a beautiful story. So if you will allow me just a moment to get situated and we will start the story. Okay. Flippy things. Oh my goodness. I cannot seem to figure out where, there we go. There's the flippy button. Come gather round to hear the legend of Christmas, when each year a mysterious figure sweeps into town, leaving presents and whispers in their wake, no, no, not Santa Claus, but his sister. This is the legend of the Christmas witch. It was the season of Yuletide, and as the cold moon shone down, the Christmas witch traveled to each little town. While mother and father slept soundly in bed, some children snuck to their windows instead. Let's see if we can get this glare off of here. There we go. Maybe there we go. Their eyes fixed on the falling snow in glimpse, in hopes of the glimpse of the witch's shadow. Like a wondrous phantom who smelled of the sea, she whistled in the darkness a strange melody. A wreath of feathers, a doll made of hair, peculiar gifts left on the doorstep with care. Though gathered at the window, they caught not a sight as the Christmas witch disappeared into the night. No doubt you've never heard the name of Christorn, for the legend of the Christmas witch is a story that's been forgotten in time. But in her day, she was familiar to the children, just like Santa Claus. In fact, she is his long lost twin sister, who for many faded reasons ended up at the South Pole. Stories and songs were written about her, yes, but as the years went on, the tales told in whispers around the fire. They become nothing more than scary stories meant to frighten children. Convinced of her evil nature, the elders were determined to erase, erase all of her memory. And then they may have succeeded until now. The tale I'm about to tell may seem to you too fantastic to be true, but I assure you it did happen. 
This is the real story of how Chris Torn became the Christmas witch. And I should know because I was there. Many, many years ago, when the world was much younger and magical beings freely roamed the earth, a pair of twin infants with red hair and green eyes were abandoned in the middle of the Black Forest. Left all alone, the deer and the foxes and even the squirrels of the forest watched over them, bringing them food and protecting them from the wilder, more dangerous creatures of the woods. The boy's name was Christopher, and the, his sister was named Christorn. They were no ordinary pair of twins, for before long they discovered they each had a unique set of gifts. Christorn had the ability to talk to the animals and with the touch of her hand, she was able to make trees and bushes grow and produce fruit. The two of them never went hungry. Christopher was able to disappear and reappear at will. And both twins shared the gift of swiftness, running around the woods at fantastic speeds. Their favorite game to play was hide and seek, and each could hide from the other for many hours before being found. Sometimes Chris Dorn would leave trails of gifts made of twigs and leaves from the forest for Christopher to find. As time passed, they developed their own secret way of communicating by whistling, imitating the strange melodies of their friend, the nightingale. At night, they would lie in the clearing and count the stars in the heavens. Their bond was deep and it was eternal. It so happened one day that while they were playing together, they heard two people talking nearby in the woods. They have never encountered other people. So Christopher whistled to his sister to go hide in the thicket for he was the brave and she was shy. By and by a Danish couple by the name of Kringle came passing through the forest clearing heading north. It was then that the boy smelled the most delicious aroma he had ever smelled and hesitantly approached them. Look at this young child, they exclaimed, for they had always dreamed of having a family, but they weren't able to have children of their own. I wonder what his name is. My name is Christopher, he said, and to his surprise, he was able to speak to them in their own language. Where are your parents, child? And why have they left you alone? I have no parents, I, he said, reaching towards the basket that the woman was carrying, from which came the most enticing smell. She picked up the young boy in her arms and handed him a warm cinnamon roll from her basket. Watching from the thicket, Chris Dorn saw the young woman pick up her brother. She called after them, fearing he was being kidnapped. But her cries only sounded like the mournful song of the nightingale. Oh, what a beautiful bird, the man exclaimed. We must always remember how magical this forest was where we found this lad. Christopher, delighted by the pastry, greedily or we had here, reached for another and momentarily forgot about his sister as the new family journeyed on. Soon they could no longer hear her frantic song. Now without her brother, Chris Dorn found herself truly alone and she began to sob big angry tears. For three days and nights, she wept and wept and no animal, large or small, could comfort her.
on the fourth day, a witch named Lutzelfrau heard her cries while gathering gray mushrooms with her raven friend perched on her shoulder. The old witch found Chris Dorn in a thicket and noticed that a beautiful holly bush had sprung up in a perfect circle around the child, protecting her with sharp leaves that repelled the wild wolves hunting food at dusk. Why do you cry, my child? The witch asked. But this only made Christorn's tears flow faster. The woman knelt down and stuck her bony hands into the bush and tried to pick her up. But though she was careful, she pricked her little finger on the leaves and it began to bleed. Ouch! Lutzelfrau shrieked. But the child inside the bush reached out her own little finger and locked it with the witches and the wound healed immediately. Lutzelfrau was astonished to see that there remained not a scratch on her hand. This child is one with nature and was born with a magic that may even rival her own. She must be protected. She said to the old raven named Malachi, who flew closer behind and cacawed in agreement. With that, she pulled Christorn out of the bush, placed her in a large satchel around her neck, and took her back to her cottage. And from that day on, Christorn was raised in Lutzelfrau's care. The Kringles returned to Alborg, as they had no children of their own, and decided to adopt Christopher. The husband, Johan, was an expert woodcutter and craftsman. The wife, Clara, was a marvelous baker and was known in her village for a delicious pastry that she made each Christmas called Kringle. As Christopher grew up in the small port village along Lumford, his family instilled in him a strong sense of duty and hard work. He spent his days learning his father's trade and was particularly fond of creating new toys that he would share with his friends in the village. In the evenings, he would watch his mother bake breads and other sweets and helped her deliver them to the townsfolk on the family sled. Meanwhile, Chris Dorn was living a wild and carefree life in the forest. She cultivated her magical abilities under Lutzelfrau's watchful eye and found that she was a quick learner. At the same time, she could also lose her temper quite easily when a spell wouldn't turn out quite right. One time, out of frustration of a spell that had went wrong, she kicked the side of a large oak tree and making a huge dent on its side. She was immediately sorry for what she had done. I vow to never lose my temper like that again, she said. Sometimes at night, after the old woman was asleep, Chris Dorn would gaze out the window in the thatched roof above her head and count the stars. Somewhere, she felt sure in some other part of the world, her brother was doing just the same. And someday, she knew she would follow the course of the stars and find him. It was finally Yuletide, a celebration of the winter solstice, and Mother Lutzelfrau was known as the Yule Witch. This time of year, the days were short and frozen. 
The nights seemed as if they'd stretch on forever. Chris Doran would help her mother prepare for those celebrations. All the creatures of the forest would gather nightly around the enormous bonfire and hang evergreen and holly springs and tree branches and sing the ancient songs to the cold moon. Gather we under the cold moon's night to come together on this yuletide night. Birds of sky and beasts of land round the fire in joining hands. Merrily we celebrate the feast of old as we prepare for the winter's cold. Chris Dorn came to have a deep love and appreciation for Yuletide, and as winter was always her favorite season. Now remember, at this time in history, fears of witchcraft became widespread throughout the continent. Many villages chased their local witches out of the surrounding forests, rounding them up and burning them at the stake. Lutzelfrau often reminded Chris Dorn, you must always be careful when you use your magic to never be seen. You are unique and not everyone will understand your power. Many will be fearful of it. But Chris Dorn had led such a sheltered life that she hardly paid any heed to her mother's warning. One day, Chris Dorn was picking berries and she came upon a small rabbit who had been struck by an arrow and was in a great deal of pain. She knelt down and cradled it in her arms and a few moments later, a young hunter, a lanky boy with curly blonde hair, came searching for his arrow and the rabbit he had shot. When he came upon Chris Dorn, he watched with admiration as the young girl so gently tended to it. Could I have that rabbit, miss? I'm going to make a stew for supper this evening. Chris Dorn turned to him and flames of anger dancing in her eyes. How could you harm this tiny creature, she demanded. What kind of wickedness consumes you? She pulled the arrow out and pointed it at him menacingly. Then he watched with horror as she healed the rabbit's wound with her other hand, and it hopped back into the woods. Witchcraft, he cried, as he raced back to his village as quickly as he could. There's a witch in the woods. Not two hours later, Malachi, Lutzelfrau's trusty messenger raven, came to her cottage with news that a mob was forming in the nearby village to find Christorn. Lutzelfrau had been waiting for this day and knew deep in her heart that she needed to send the child away to save her life. I bring some news for Chris Dorn too, the raven said. A friend of mine just returned from the northern Scandinavian mountains and has seen her brother Christopher there. He lives simply among the elves, called the Nisser, and raises a herd of reindeer. Later that evening, as she sipped dandelion tea after supper, she broke the news of the mob to Chris Dorn. It is no longer safe for you to be here. It's time for you to travel far, far away to another part of the world. Chris Dorn begged her to let her stay. The old witch was unrelenting, but she did share Malachi's news of her brother. You have a destiny, my child, she said poking at the leaves at the bottom of the girl's mug with her bony finger. I cannot say exactly what it is, but it will take you to the distant shore, to the very tip of the earth. In that case, I will go north and I will find my brother, the girl said, comforted by the thought. We were separated against our will in the forest, and I feel certain he is looking for me too. He will protect me. The next morning, they went down by the Rhine River, using their magic, built a small boat out of pine wood. The old witch lined the boat with soft sheep's wool and packed it with nuts and seeds that she'd been storing away for the winter months. In the bow of the boat, she tucked a holly sapling to remind Kerstorn of her home. Then Letzelfrau took her own cape, 
woven out of leaves and grasses from the forest floor and placed it around Christorn's shoulders to keep her warm and dry. After I find Christopher, I will someday return for you, mother, Christorn told her. How kind you are, Christorn, but I am old now and not much longer for this world. We may not see each other again, but Malachi is here and he is never far and will watch out for you. Then, with some effort, set the boat in the water. Mother and daughter hugged and said their final goodbyes. Then Chris Dorn recited a little spell. Frothy currents, winds, and tides cast me across the sea. Propel this boat with fiercest speed. So may it be, so may it be. Be careful, Chris Dorn. You may harness the waters, but you cannot control the oceans. Go slow and steady, stay the course, and always keep your temper in check, for losing it can only lead to great destruction. Yes, mother, I know, Chris Dorn answered impatiently. And with a gentle push of, Lust of Lutzelfrau's gnarled foot, she took off and they waved at each other. The small boat floated down the Rhine, winding and twisting along to where it eventually emptied into the enormous wild North Sea. From there, it continued down the oceans, unimpeded in its journey, fueled by the swiftness spell that Chris Dorn had cast, but she was not satisfied. Faster, faster, faster! Chris Dorn used the full extent of her powers but she still wasn't satisfied with the boat's momentum. Faster still, and the boat began to crack and creak. She dropped her hand into the water, churning the waves until she had created a raging maelstrom. The boat rocked and creaked so violently that the sides splintered off until it was nothing more than a raft. Chris Dorn clung to the edges, trying desperately to stop the storm with her powers. As the wind whipped around her, the waves crashed over her. Finally, the winds died down. Drenched with seawater and exhausted from the storm, she laid down and slept. What remained of her boat now drifted aimlessly for thousands of miles into the endless sea. A family of leopard seals emerged from the water and helped guide the vessel to a large mass of land in the distance. Eventually, her raft ran aground on a shore of solid ice. Wearily, the young girl looked out of the boat at the vast emptiness of the frozen windswept ice plains and the never ending great sky. At last, I've reached the North Pole, she thought, and then she collapsed back onto the boards and fell into an even deeper sleep. Little did Chris Dorn know she had actually reached the undiscovered continent of Antarctica, the opposite end of the globe from her brother's North Pole. By and by, a pair of mismatched red and blue eyes over a large orange beak peeked curiously at the wreckage. A yellow feathered plume cocked to one side. These belonged to a young macaroni penguin named Ellesmere. He gazed for a moment at the beautiful girl sleeping soundly, but nearly frozen under a wet woolen blanket as she clutched the small holly tree. He called out to his brothers and sisters who were fishing for cod in a nearby cove. Slippery snow caps, come and see what I found. I think it might be human. But the other penguins, already annoyed that he wasn't helping them fish, dismissed him. Not again, Ellesmere. Stop being silly. There's never been a human down here before. It's probably just a bunch of tangled sea kelp. Can't you see we're busy? 
We need to finish before the sun goes down. But he persisted. No, it's a human girl, and she looks frozen. We must help her. Finally, out of curiosity, they ran and joined him. When they saw he was right, it was indeed human, and she would never survive the night as she was. They pulled Chris Dorn's raft miles and miles across the dark tundra, under the light of the full moon, until they reached their home at the foot of the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. While she slept in his nest of grass and stones, Elsmere cuddled up beside her to keep her warm, occasionally nudging her gently with his beak to see if she would wake. After many hours, she finally blinked her eyes open and looked wide-eyed at her icy surroundings. I made it! She screamed in joy. The other penguins gathered around in surprise to see her awake. Christorn was so relieved to see her holly tree had survived the trip she hugged Ellesmere and exclaimed, I must be very far north. You see, I am on a journey to find my brother. He must be around here somewhere. Have you seen a young boy who looks just like me, with red hair just as red and eyes just as green? Hearing this, the other penguins burst out laughing. Ellesmere shook his feathers at them and then turned to her. I'm so sorry to say this to you, but you are far from the north. This is the South Pole. Chris Dorn's heart sank and her temper flared. Angrily, she began to kick the stones out of the nest. And as the other penguins scurried away, all except Ellesmere, Whoa! he laughed. Don't worry, you can stay here with us as long as you need. My nest is your nest. Days turned into weeks, and as time passed, Chris Dorn grew accustomed to the frigid existence at the end of the earth. She built a hut made of ice, and in the center, she dug a hole in the snow and planted her holly tree, infusing it with her magic to take root. When this tree grows large enough, I will use its branches to make a new boat, and I will sail home. Ellesmere stitched a beautiful white woolen robe for her to keep warm. She wore this always as well as donning her mother's cape of leaves. Her hair grew wild and dark fiery red and she adorned it with sprigs of holly and mistletoe. Because it was always bitter cold in the tundra and winter lasted most of the year in the South Pole, Chris Dorn declared that it shall always be Yuletide her favorite season. She taught the penguins all of the traditions and rituals she learned from Mother Lutzelfrau. One evening, after yet another Yuletide celebration, a large black bird swooped down out of the blazing white sky, crash landing into a snowbank. The penguins hurtled up ready to defend themselves against the mysterious intruder. But as Chris Dorn approached the snowbank, she realized quickly that it was old Malachi, whom she had last seen in the ocean storm so long ago. He lifted his distinguished beak, faded gray, from years flown by. My child, I've searched every corner of the earth for you, and finally here you are. Could you have picked a more impossible place to land? Oh, Malachi, I've missed you, she cried. I bring news to you from the old world, the raven said as she knelt down and kissed his head. But first, I must dry the snow from my feathers by the fire. Chris Dorn and Ellesmere helped him inside her hut, and she shook his feathers dry. Later, they sipped pine needle tea by the fire. Your mother, Lutzelfrau, I'm sorry to say, is no more. She's been gone for some time now. And here he paused with a slight cough as Chris Dorn's eyes filled with tears. But I have news of your brother. My brother, Chris Dorn exclaimed, her grief now quickly turning to joy. Yes, your brother. 
Christopher now goes by the name of Kringle, and he has built a home in the North Pole. He is now known to the world for his kindness and generosity. And every year, just after the first day of winter, on the eve of the holiday called Christmas, he travels the globe in his sleigh. The sleigh is pulled by a team of reindeer from village to village, bringing gifts to the children and spreading joy to all whom he meets. In some parts, he is so beloved that they have called him St. Nicholas or Sinterklaas. Have you seen him? Has he asked about me? I have not seen him. Almost no one has. He moves so swiftly while he works, and then he disappears before anyone can catch him. I will catch him, for no one knows and understands him better than I. With a new determined energy, she called her council of penguins together to announce her new plan. The time has come, the tree is ready, we will build a new boat, even stronger than the first, and set sail before this Christmas Eve. They nodded their beaks in agreement, eager to help. She selected the six bravest and best swimmers of the group to travel with her. Ellesmere raised his wing. Can I come too? I know I'm not a great swimmer, but I promise to make a jolly companion. Chris Storm patted his head. Of course, silly. I can't wait for you to meet my brother. Chris Dorn and her penguin friends finished assembling the boat just as the cold moon was rising in the sky. Then they headed for the coast with Malachi, perched at the bow. They traveled for three days straight and on Christmas Eve reached the European continent. Chris Dorn sailed to all the major port cities one after another. Lisbon, Venice, Athens, Istanbul, Stockholm, Dubrovnik. She sailed to Marseille, to Belfast, to St. Petersburg. In each port, she moored her boat and hidden in the dark of night. Leaving Ellesmere to keep watch and with Malachi perched on her shoulders, she climbed silently onto the wooden dock, leaving a trail of salt water and seaweed behind her. She crept quietly along the cobblestone streets, peering through the window panes of the darkened houses as children slept looking desperately for her brother. Malachi warned her not to disturb the sleeping families, but Chris Dorn, always impatient, would somehow, sometimes, stick her head right through their windows and whistle a nightingale song in hopes that Christopher would hear. She searched for miles among the country farms where even the animals rustled in their barn stalls at her passing. She sometimes found fresh reindeer tracks in the mud of the barnyard or a snowbank next to a chimney and would press on, feeling certain that her brother was close at hand. As the Christmas dawn was breaking and her search was coming to an end, she happened upon a barn owl named Ruth, who was awake and sitting in quiet thought, high up in the rafters. Quickly, she explained her quest. What a pity, Ruth said. You've just missed him. You saw him then? No, but I heard the tinkling of his sleigh bells, said the owl who was known for her keen hearing. I flew to the windowsill just in time to see the back of a sled disappear into the night. With a sigh, Chris Dorn headed back to the boat as the sun rose on the horizon. She was too late and would have to try again next year. And so she did every Yuletide season she would search and search, determined to catch him once and for all. She tried leaving little gifts of her own at the doorsteps, hoping to catch her brother's eye, but the adults took these gifts, a woven grass doll, a wreath of penguin feathers, a simple bouquet of holly leaves, to be evil pagan objects. Sometimes a curious child would beg to keep the trinkets, but they were quickly burned in fireplaces never to be spoken of again. 
each house that she visited was dreaming of the coming of Christmas morning, but occasionally a sleepless child would catch an eerie glimpse of Christorn at the window. Some would stir awake, frightened by the sound of her strange song, only to catch her disappearing into the night. And it was then that the whispers about the Christmas witch began. As time passed and more and more glimpses were caught of her, the tales of the Christmas witch spread. Unbeknownst to Christorn, children far and wide now eagerly looked for her as expectantly as for Santa Claus, much to their parents' horror. Finally, after years of searching, Christorn, weary and ready to give up for good, found herself in the piazza of the small Italian village of Luca. The square was deserted, dark and silent, with a heavy snow falling and filling the air. Across the square, she spotted a large, burly man loading a sack into the sleigh. How strange, she whispered to Malachi, that this man would be traveling like me in the middle of the night, when the rest of the world is asleep. His clothes, too, were completely foreign to this country. Just then, the moon came out of the clouds and lit up the square, and the man turned and saw her. Right away, she recognized him, her brother. Though it had been many, many years, his face was still familiar to her. The same red hair, now straight with gray, the same emerald eyes that matched her own and twinkled in the moonlight. A look of recognition and understanding passed between them. Then Chris Storm pursed her lips and let out the familiar melodic whistle. She waited in suspense as the snow continued to fall, so long that she thought the man had gone. Then, though, the crisp air came the answering whistle from her brother. Her heart was overjoyed. But as Christorn moved closer to speak to him, she heard the cries of many voices behind her. This way, I heard that witch's song coming from the square. A mob of men and women descended on the square from all the surrounding streets, holding torches, calling for the Christmas witch. They were determined to be rid of her once and for all. My dear sister, Christopher yelled, you must run away. It is not safe for you here. Run, and I shall find you as soon as I can. And in a flash, Chris Kringle, with a familiar wink of his eye and the twist of his head, hopped in his sleigh and was carried into the night air. Chris Dorn ran down the nearest alley, with Malachi flying close behind. The mob advanced on her, but she moved like the wind and was faster than they were. Malachi turned around and flapped his wings in the faces to distract them. Beware of the cursed pet of the Christmas witch, they howled as they covered their heads. She leaves evil objects at our own doors to lure children into the night. She wants to ruin Christmas. Please, she cried, I am no enemy of Christmas. I am not evil. I swear it. But as they ignored her pleas, and they continued after her, she ran to the dock, calling to Ellesmere, and hopped in her boat. The villagers screamed and yelled for her at the pier, but they were unable to catch her. She and her penguins sailed down the Sergio River and eventually off into the dark sea. She returned to her icy fortress, all the while searching for her brother among the clouds in the sky. She was sure he'd never find her once she returned to the South Pole. Ellesmere and the other penguins gathered in a circle around her and presented her with a Yule log in hopes to cheer her up. As they huddled around the fire, Chris Dorn wept. Another year's journey wasted. 
And now, not only had she lost her brother again, but it seemed as if the whole world had turned against her. Suddenly, the sound of distant bells and a streak of light flashed across the sky. They all looked up and witnessed an incredible sight. The flying reindeer pulling a massive sleigh with Christopher at the helm. Chris Dorn wiped her tears away and jumped up and down. My brother. Christopher landed hit the sleigh with a gentle thud. Christopher and Chris Dorn were together at last and sat by the fire. He offered her some gingerbread cookies from his bag while they told each other stories of growing up in worlds so far apart. It is good that you have made your home here, Chris Dorn. The new world is not safe for you. As for me, I have responsibilities now. I have become an important figure in the new Christmas Eve tradition and I must fulfill this destiny. Can't I come with you, brother? I can help you deliver your gifts. My penguin friends are surely up for the task. Chris Dorn off. Christopher held her hand and looked deeply into her hopeful eyes. No, Chris Dorn, you're far too different for them to accept. There is no place for you out there. Stay here where you are safe. And someday I am certain things will change. And while Chris Dorn contemplated his words, he left up with another wink of his eye and a twist of his head and hopped in the sleigh and disappeared once more. Now, as you remember, Chris Dorn was prone to losing her temper. And as she stared at the burning Yule log, the flames of the roaring fire reflecting in her eyes, she seethed with an increasing rage. How is there no place for me out there in the world? How could he have chosen them over me? Ellesmere hesitantly approached her and quietly asked, will you go after him? She turned to him and something was different about her gaze. No, I don't need my brother. Lutzelfrau was wrong. He was never my destiny. All those years searching in vain and only to watch my precious Yuletide be destroyed by greed? My destiny is clear now. I'm going to ruin this Christmas holiday once and for all. Chris Dorn's anger flowed out of her and began, the ground began to tremble. Malachi flew around her in a circle, trying to calm her. You must not get excited, my child. No need to do anything drastic now. But in her fury, she stomped her feet on the ground three times. The last stomp proved to be the strongest, for it cracked the solid ice floor wide open, swallowing up Chris Dorn, Ellesmere, and all of her penguin companions. They immediately froze beneath the surface into blocks of ice, not dead, just asleep. And that is where they've remained ever since. As centuries passed, talk of the Christmas witch was forbidden by parents all over the world. Meanwhile, Chris Dorn's ice palace gradually fell into disrepair and slowly disappeared into the icy Antarctic blizzards. Eventually, brave explorers from other continents began taking expeditions down there, planting their nation's flags and claiming the South Pole for their own. Unaware of its queen, who lay asleep beneath the ice. Slowly, the earth warmed and the movement of the seas changed and the once solid glaciers began to melt and every year, the Christmas witch's tomb of ice drip, drip, drips away. And so now you know that the Christmas witch was not always evil. In fact, she was my friend. I watched her grow up in the forest as a kind and caring child, and I watched the world slowly turn against her. 
I was there the day she made that faithful third stomp as I flapped my wings and flew away. I watched the ice break open and an avalanche of snow wash over it, sealing her fate. Let this be a warning that she will be back in the world and she will seek out her destiny to save Christmas or destroy it. Her emerald eyes will open in the blinding light of the early morning sun, but her heart will still be frozen by the injustice that she suffered. I do not know if she has forever been changed or if the goodness in her will eventually win out. I only hope I live to see it. The end. So this story took an interesting turn, but it did fit the theme of reading ghost stories. A little bit different of a ghost story. I hope you liked it, and we will definitely have a story on Monday. We will pick up with the Valancourt series. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a great evening, and stay safe out there. And maybe watch your temper a little more often. I know I probably will. <laughs>